And now, it's time for the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show with Snowden Bishop. Listen in as Snowden interviews cannabis industry pioneers, marijuana experts, policymakers, medical practitioners, patients, and other amazing individuals with compelling stories to share. It all happens right now. Here's the Cannabis Reporter, Snowden Bishop. Hi, and welcome back to the Cannabis Reporter Radio Show. I'm Snowden Bishop. I'm happy you could join us. In our last interview with Jessica Chandler and Denise Mahaffey, we discussed some of the insidious ways in which toxic contaminants turn up in soil substrates commonly used to grow fruits, vegetables, and cannabis. We also talked about the importance of testing at every point in the supply chain from seed to sale. Otherwise, what's to protect patients from toxins, heavy metals, and pathogens that have serious health ramifications? We also touched on ways in which consumers can protect themselves by demanding certificates of analysis from manufacturers of every cannabis product before buying it just to ensure that it's safe. The cannabis industry has, for the most part, been hyper-vigilant about self-testing for obvious reasons. Compliance with state regulations would be one, and earning consumer trust being the other. But on the other hand, the pharmaceutical industry has been shrouded in secrecy. It's rare for a drug company to automatically make a certificate of analysis available for public examination, and even more rare for patients to request one which seems counterintuitive considering how few of us know where, how, or with what raw materials our prescription drugs are made. And with the exception of regulation by the FDA and DEA, there's really little accountability. It seems strange that we vest so much trust in an industry we know so little about. And more so given that the industry can be blamed for hundreds of thousands of lost lives, Not to mention the presence of toxins and pathogens that really the human body wasn't designed to safely process. The same can be said for vaccines. While inoculations are mandatory in some states, the manufacturers are not required to disclose the binders that carry the pathogens that are injected directly into the bloodstream. Over the last decade, the number of vaccinations required has increased exponentially, as has the number of children who are being diagnosed with pediatric asthma, autoimmune conditions, and autism, which were far less common before the required number of inoculations increased. To be clear, there's no definitive proof that vaccines cause any of these conditions. However, like so many pharmaceutical drugs, They've come under scrutiny due to the incidental correlation between the onset of symptoms and the date of injection. Despite the public consternation, there's little information about the molecular composition and methods used to harvest pathogens, which begs yet another question, why not? If I were a conspiracy theorist, I could hazard a guess that there are dozens of reasons not the least of which would point to the autonomy vested in the industry by regulatory agencies that kowtow to their powerful lobbies. All things considered, there is a reason why pharmaceutical industry is so shrouded in secrecy. Full disclosure about their methods, sources, and materials could expose them to liability. And what's more, they could be held accountable. That's the topic of today's show, and I'm really excited to introduce our guest, Dr. Judy Mikovits. For nearly three decades, she was a researcher at the National Institute of Cancer, and she specialized in retroviruses and developing new drug pathways to deal with the insidious problem. She's also author of the book called Plague, which is an eye-opening expose of what goes on in the pharmaceutical industry and beyond. And she's written her second book now, which is called Plague of Corruption, which goes into some sordid details about how she was targeted and harassed for discovering something that could cost some of the pharmaceutical companies a great deal of money. Dr. Judy, thank you so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to delving into this with you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Snowden. Your book is fascinating. And like I've told you before, I really believe that this should be a New York Times bestseller. The information that you're offering is something that is just not widely known to many people. 
and I, I think it's so important that everybody should know about it, but thank you for writing it. <laughs> Yeah, most of the thanks goes to Ken Tech and Lively, um, my co-author. Uh, he he co-wrote the first book, uh, uh, Plague. And basically, when you hear me talk, you'll understand that I talk like a scientist. And he said, Judy, if uh, and and Kent is currently a sixth grade science teacher, but also trained um, a trained attorney, so he knows how to ask questions. So he would literally tape every word I say and turn it into a story um, at the story that you see there. So he's just br brilliant storyteller and um, every word of it is fact. Every word of it is on paper and it's backed up by, as you know, hundreds of references. So um, uh, that, that, that people can actually understand how that we call it. It's called the plague of corruption. And that's because there's so much corruption in medicine and science surround, surrounding not only the topic of the book, which is vaccine injury, um, but even therapeutics for vaccine injury, um, uh, which is um, uh, cannabis. And and so we're we're led to believe by a corrupt media, um, you know, uh, we're 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 uh, calling it, <laughs> you know, weed and and. And, and now the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, is talking at great length about all of this vaping causing all of these horrible things. And um, it's just to uh, have people not use a plant, uh, which can be used medically, to uh, cure uh, a lot of the diseases caused by too much inappropriate activation of the immune system. So I'm going to ask you to just give the mile high view of both books, both the plague and plague of corruption for people who haven't read the plague and who you'd like to read plague of corruption. Once it's published, just give us the mile high view of it. Well, um, it, it's interesting because it all wraps around to cannabis. So you can find both books and information about them at plaguethebook.com. So the website is plaguethebook.com. And um, they're both sold on Amazon. You can pre-order the second one as soon as it's out, Plague of Corruption. Um, but the mile high view of plague is that in 2000, so my entire career is as a um, cancer um, scientists um, studying um, immune therapies um, for uh, diseases caused by retroviruses. That's HIV AIDS. Um, so um, my thesis actually changed the paradigm for HIV AIDS. Um, and it came, uh, it was defended on November 9, November 14, 1991. And that was a week after Magic Johnson was found to have um, be infected with HIV. And so though at that time, everyone infected with HIV was dying, um, except for a group of people using cannabis. And we can talk about that at great length. And, and, and we understand why from a scientific point of view now. Um, so um, at, at any rate, so my career is developing immune therapy and understanding how viruses dysregulate the immune system to cause disease. And so developing therapies to prevent disease, immune therapies, and, and that would be the definition of a, of a vaccine. Well, in HIV AIDS, the big problem was the blood supply was contaminated. And of course, the, the, the prevailing dogma that was that it was only um, gay men prostitutes, IV drug users, and, and the viruses could only be transmitted sexually. Um, <clears throat> Until, of course, we, we learned of um, Ryan White, the little boy, and Arthur Ashe, um, um, both transfusion transmitted, um, so the blood supply becoming contaminated. So, you know, the 20,000-foot view of, of plague of disease, the, the first book called Plague, um, was that we identified a new family of retroviruses. We isolated them from people with um, not only autism, um, but cancer, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, ME-CFS, um, any number of cancers. It was first identified as a possibility um, 
sequences were found in prostate cancer. So, so here now is a, a new family of, of viruses which um, caused um, devastating diseases that um, didn't kill you right away as HIV AIDS did, um, but um, a, of course um, were found, you know, we found the blood supply to be contaminated as we knew the blood supply was back in the 80s with HIV. And of course, then one of our colleagues suggested this, that this retrovirus family, because it was related to mouse cancer causing and and neurological disease causing viruses, he said one of the most widely um, use products where we use mouse tissue as biological therapies, including um, vaccines. So how did a mouse virus get into humans? Well, vaccines. So our our paper came out in one of the best journals in the world on October 8th, um, was published and peer reviewed for for more than six months, you know, to make sure these data were right. Um, And basically it was just an, oh my God, because it became obvious to us and to all of NIH and and the governments worldwide um, that um, we had actually caused the, the zoonosis. That's the jumping from animals into humans of a mouse-related virus, almost certainly by not only a contaminated blood supply, um, but uh, by vaccines. And and this virus was found in even the healthy population, so healthy or apparently healthy character um, carriers, and it's 25 times what HIV was when Magic Johnson um, was found to have AIDS at the height of the epidemic in the U.S. in 1991. See, that is the most frightening thing to me, uh, aside from the (laughs) cover-up that ensued, you know, subsequently. But just to think that a lot of these autoimmune diseases, and let's face it, we have an epidemic of autoimmune conditions in this country. Correct. And with the prevalence of all of these autoimmune diseases, the fact that this isn't like the most critical topic when it comes to public health, you know, especially from the government level, it should be. And we should be addressing it right away just so that the next generation doesn't have to be contaminated the way that the way that we are. And there's this whole movement that has caused a lot of consternation in the medical community, the movement of anti-vax. And I think that what's important for people to understand is that the theory of vaccination is not what's dangerous. You know, putting these pathogens in the human body to strengthen the immune system and to uh, create antibodies within the human body, that's a very important thing. And we've eradicated a lot of diseases because of it. But the, the thing that even the anti-vax proponents should understand is it really isn't about that. It's about the zoonosis, as you say, the way that these vaccines are made, these sort of irresponsible way that vaccines are made. We should be demanding as a public, you know, changes to the way that they deliver these vaccines. And by deliver, I mean the formulas that they put into the vaccines or, or the way that they're developing the pathogens, number one. But number two, another thing that I've heard is the delivery mechanism of like the, the corn-based formulas, you know, with some of the the toxins that are prevalent in corn products in general, because most of them come from GMO corn. I mean, it's a problem. So what do you tell a discerning public about what they should do to try to protect the vaccine supply, number one, but number two, what can they do to protect their children if they're being forced to subject their children to vaccinations that could potentially be contaminated? Well, and and, and they, in fact, they are contaminated and you're exactly right. And it's not corn in fact that they're made in it's it's there while there is corn syrup and and glyphosate the roundup 
that is associated with cancer is now in a big lawsuit. The the topic of the second book is the plague of corruption. So we found these zoonoses happening. And, and as you mentioned, you know, it's not the vaccines of old. It's not the old schedule. It's not the way they were made before. And, and what most people don't realize is that in 1986, when many of these um, injuries were becoming apparent um, with the DTP shot because of the cellular debris from animal t- 